now my pleasure to introduce our President, Marshall Chin. Marshall is a researcher and scholar of world-class level. He's the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics in the Department of Medicine, University of Chicago. He's been a mentor, a friend to many of us, and he has been a tireless leader for our organization. It's a delight to introduce him as your president. Well, thanks very much, Stephen. And on behalf of SJM, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here attending the national meeting. So the president's talk is the state of SJM talk. And what I'd like you to do is to sit back and relax, for I'm going to tell you a number of stories. I'm going to introduce the concept of a developmental life course and tell the story of where SGIM is on its journey. I'm going to discuss challenges for SGIM, both those external to our organization and those internal to the House of Academic General Internal Medicine. I'll then tell a couple stories which I hope will help define SGIM as an action organization and help define our values. I'll end with a discussion of our six strategic priorities and our path forward. So this is my wife, Naoko, who's here in the audience. And this is a Korean restaurant somewhere in Japan. And Naoko and I are part of what some have called the bridge generation. Bridge in the sense that we have a child. This is our son, Toshi, who's also here. He's now 13 years old, and, and Toshi is at that age where he's not particularly excited about having his picture taken, and so sadly, this is one of the better pictures of Toshi over the past year. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Bridge also in that both Naoko and I have or, or had older parents. Uh, in the front of this picture, you see Toshi when he's acting human. Uh, and in the back of the picture, you see Naoko with her two parents. This is uh, her childhood home where she grew up in Tokyo. And her father, I, I actually never knew him when he was a physically strong man. That about a, month, a year before we got married, he had a major stroke complicated by meningitis. And so he was very frail the rest of his life. But I think that towards the end of his life, that at least a couple things brought him peace. One was when Noka and I got married that it's got to be reassuring when all of your children have found their life partners. And the second, when Toshi was born too, you could tell that was special, that Toshi represented youth and hope, the continuation of the family, the continuation of the bloodlines. Noka's father passed away two years ago, and there's a tradition in Japan where a year after someone has passed, there are ceremonies to honor the deceased. And so about a year ago, we went back to Japan. We spent a, a week in Tokyo for the ceremonies, then a week in a part of Japan where possibly no one else here in this room has been to. It's called the Key Mountain Range. It's considered to be a mysterious part of Japan. It's part of the old religious pilgrimage routes. At the two, first two hotels we stood at, or stayed at, I was mesmerized by two mandalas that were in the lobby. And mandala is a, a spiritual and ritual symbol representing the universe. This first mandala depicted the area that we were staying at in this pilgrimage area. And again, it showed a pilgrimage, the idea of, of life as a journey. The second mandala, I'd like you to concentrate upon the arch at the top of the mandala. What it is is the arc of life, and it starts off with birth childhood, adulthood, older age, including frailty, and then eventually death and judgment. And you see this judge looking at the globe here on the right, which is, I believe, a reenactment of one's life. And if one had led a bad life and one was evil, really bad things could happen to you in the afterlife. In fact, really bad things. <laughs> but if you were good, well, there was eternity of, of happiness and bliss and peace. So this idea of the development of life course as a journey with an epic nature, that there could be great good as well as badness and evil. 
It applies to our patients also, that a couple months ago I saw one of my favorite patients for the last time. She was an older African-American woman who had bad lung disease. And at the beginning of this year in January, she started having abdominal pain, which just didn't get better. And so workup eventually revealed pancreatic cancer metastatic to the liver. And so at this visit two months ago, I saw her for the last time, and she was accompanied by her two daughters, and it was a very difficult visit. You know, the four people in the room, my patient was the most composed. She was at peace with herself, and she really was ready for whatever the future held. The two daughters were having a real hard time. One actually had to leave the room briefly to compose herself. She came back. Then as I started talking about prognosis and the plan ahead and the future, the two daughters started crying. And I could feel sort of the te tears welling up in my own eyes. And there have been times where I have openly wept with my patients at the end of their lives. But this just didn't feel right at this time. And so what I then told the two daughters and my patient was something that I never quite said this before to any of my patients. And what I told them that I was thinking a lot recently about the life course, that we start as infants, become toddlers, children, adolescents, young adults, mid-career folks, older people, and eventually we all face death. And I told them, and the two daughters, that at each stage things could go well or things could go poorly. And in some ways our job was to try to make sure that at each stage, including at death, that things went as well as possible. You know, for whatever reasons, this had an calming effect that the, the, the two daughters stopped crying, they, they tuned in, and the rest of the visit went fairly well. So SJM, we're really facing these same issues, that we're about to celebrate our 40th anniversary next year. We're not a young organization, we're not an old organization, we're a middle-aged organization. And we have members at all ages, we have the newbies who are, this is their first meeting, the excitement of that first meeting. We have people that have been here for, for 10, 20 years, and we have the lions and lionesses of SJM, the founders of SJM, the founders of Academic General Internal Medicine, who have been coming to the meeting for 40 years. And so in this challenging time that we have, we must both look backwards for lessons learned, as well as we must be forward-looking as we constructively think about how do we transform healthcare for our survival and for our patients. We also as a society need to look, think about how do we serve all our members, whether, whether they are our, our most junior members, our mid-career folks, or our senior members. So put on your hiking shoes, SJM, because we are on a journey. And it's not, uh, it's not sunny out there. You know, there's rain out there. We've got to bring out the umbrellas. But we're in together, our young members, our mid-career members, and our older members. And they're going to be forks in the road. We have difficult choices to make. But the sun is starting to come out, and Tushy's putting away his umbrella. And he's made a choice. You know, we are taking the path. And we're not alone. You know, Grandma's there looking over Toshi. And you notice at Toshi's right, there is a guidepost. There's a signpost. We're not just walking blindly in the wilderness, but there's a way ahead. So I'm not going to talk a great deal about environment, because you're going to hear a, a terrific plenary uh, tomorrow by Tim Ferriss. He's a great speaker. Um, you're going to love his talk. And then a lot of the abstracts and workshops uh, at this meeting really are on these different issues. But in brief, record levels of physician burnout relatively few students entering primary care, value, efficiency, productivity being the buzzwords of the day, disparities, inequity remain rampant, a difficult time as we shift from fee-for-service to global payment and pay for performance, population health, the theme of this meeting, coming to the forefront, and increasing interest in addressing social determinants of health, a time of reform and change. Internally at each of our organizations, we, our roles and job descriptions are in flux. What's the right mix of clinical care, education, and research? The right mix of inpatient and outpatient care? What is valued in our home institutions? We're all under increased financial pressures. There's less margin for unfunded activities. And yet, it's a time of opportunity. You know, my mayor in Chicago, Ron Manuel, he has a saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. And he's right, it's a time of change and reform, and in this time, our strengths as academic journal internists are greatly needed because we're innovative and we're patient-centered. I'd now like to share with you a couple stories that I hope crystallize who we are as an action organization and what our values are. So the man in the upper left here, his name is Steve McPhee. He's an emeritus professor at UCSF. 
And when I was a fourth year student there, he did something for me that, in retrospect, was incredibly helpful. It's something that we could do for all of our fourth year students, but we don't do enough of. I came up to Steve and told him, you know, here are the 12 programs I'm going to apply for in internal medicine and primary care programs. And what Steve said was, Marshall, we're so fortunate that we have so many great colleagues across the country in general internal medicine. And we're fortunate also that there are outstanding training programs in each region of the country. What I want you to do is, besides the people that formally interviewed you, I want you to look up the one or two people I'm going to give you at each of these 12 different places. Let me just tell you a little bit more about general internal medicine. So one of the places I applied to was the primary care program at the University of Washington. And the man on the list was Tom Anui. Now, so for the younger members here who don't know Tom, Tom is one of the icons of SGIM. Uh, when I met him 27, 28 years ago, he was the division chief at University of Washington, based at Harborview, the county hospital. He's a past president of SJM. Like Ann Nattinger, he's won the Glazer Award, our, our highest uh, honor. Um, and really, to put it succinctly, Tom is the closest thing we have in SJM to one of my heroes, <laughs> Master Yoda, my favorite character in the Star Wars trilogy, or, or, or six, six trilogy. Um, you know, Tom is one of the wisest, most philosophical people in SJM. He's a true champion for the good and a true hero of, of general internal medicine. And so I, I called up Tom's office and um, I ended up getting a, an evening appointment that he, Tom fit me at the end of the day. I, I vividly remember it's like 5, 30, 6 o'clock, you know, walk up the hill to Harborview. Uh, it was, light was falling. And then Tom did something extraordinary. Uh, what Tom did was he, he didn't interview me. He really didn't even spend much time talking about the University of Washington's primary care program. But what he did was he spent half an hour mentoring me, mentoring this fourth year student he didn't know from a hole in the wall, wasn't even from his own institution, half an hour asking about my values, my aspirations, what I wanted to do in my career, what I wanted to do in life. And in some ways, this is just so emblematic of who we are as an organization, the nurturance and the mentoring of our members. You know, if we fast forward to one year ago, literally one year ago, uh, we were walking to the plenary session, and as you notice, this is a mob of people walking to the plenary, and Tom happened to see me, and he basically said, congratulations, Marshall, congratulations on your presidency year, I have some advice for you. And so at that point, I just locked into Tom's eyes, and I just was oblivious to the rest of the people coming by, because it's not that often that Master Yoda has advice for you. And I'm going to paraphrase Tom, but basically what he said was, I have two pieces of advice. One, remember, SJM is an evidence-based scientific organization. And then second, Marshall, remember, this is not a time to be shy. This is a time for advocacy. It's a time for social justice. Evidence-based scientific rigor, advocacy and social justice. There's a third bullet here, which Tom didn't say, but which, which he would wholeheartedly agree with, generous, supportive community. These are the three principles that define SJM and which are incredibly rare for any national organization. You can look at our website, it's a mission statement, it's about a page or two long, but really, it crystallizes down to these three key principles. And we're gonna need to use these principles because we're in difficult times. You now, increasingly in healthcare and in our broader society, we're faced with a number of difficult structural systems issues that often have complex social, cultural, and emotional overlays. And I was pleased that when I saw the annual program, there's a session uh, in one of the symposia is on the populational issues of police brutality and black men. Now, being here in Chicago, we have struggled with the legacy of Laquan McDonald, who's a 17-year-old young man here who was gunned down by police for no apparent reason. How can we change the structure and culture of the Chicago Police Department to prevent such tragedies? Nationally, we're in the midst of, I think, probably the most bitter, divisive, mean-spirited presidential election in our lifetimes. And uh, you know, my wife, Nalko, she works at the University of Illinois Chicago. And the political here, politicals here will recognize that this was the first of the rallies that Donald Trump had where uh, the, actually had to be canceled because the pro-Trump supporters and the anti-Trump demonstrators really clashed and there was, a, there was a fear of significant violence. Now, my, uh, our winter vacation, we spent uh, a week in Michigan skiing, which was a great time. 
but I actually found myself just drawn to my laptop late at night and early in the morning because I was just driven to write this essay that I entitled Movement Advocacy, Personal Relationships, and Ending Healthcare Disparities. I use healthcare disparities as an example, but it really applies to the general healthcare issues that we're looking at. That in this essay, I basically argue that we need to use advocacy to address and develop support to attack the structural and systems issues we face. We need to use evidence and science then to, to guide our solutions. And at the same time, we have to have personal relationships that are trusting and warm because the type of grassroots frontline transformation that occur just can't happen if this conflict and clash. It's a role for advocacy, critically important. We have to do it. At the same time, we have to build a trusting relationships. And that's why I think that SJM is just so unusual. I mean, an organization that has that advocacy attitude, the social justice principle, the belief in science and, and, and evidence, and then also importantly, just the collaborative nature, the support of nature. It's just, just so rare. And so we, I think we're primed to actually do great things to this as a society. You know, again, as a microcosm, this was the essay I've written that I've asked for the most feedback on, all these people here, most who are SGM members, because it's a controversial topic and I want to get it right. So in some ways, this represents the best of SJM, diverse folks who were really tough. I mean, they gave honest, tough feedback. At the same time, they were incredibly encouraging and supportive. So again, emblematic of SJM. So now I'm going to segue into SGM's six strategic priorities. And I'll just sort of mention that it's a planning process that was broad-based. It involved council, committees, task forces. It involved everyone here. We really look at the membership survey that was done a couple years ago. I also mentioned, too, that it really reflects continuity of efforts over time. Two years ago, when I got the call asking if I would run for president, before I accepted, I talked to four prior presidents, Ann Nanninger, Eric Bass, Bill Moran, Gary Rosenthal. And one thing they all said was that there was an increasing uh, movement over the past several years to make sure there was continuity, that it wasn't just like one theme one year and then a totally different theme another year. And really, these six themes represent the work of prior councils, as well as this year's council, who've been a tremendous group to work with. You know, one of the joys of SGM, probably the greatest joy is the people here working with all of you and working with council. Council is an incredibly wise collegial group, uh, true servants of SGM. I've learned so much about leadership from my colleagues here on council. So thank you very much, council members. You know, for those of you more interested, I've used most of my SGM forum presidential columns to discuss these six priorities in more detail. Uh, this week's column that just came out is really one entitled uh, Lessons Learned for Being a Sham President. And the editor, Horowitz, uh, Karen Horowitz, uh, editor of Forum, has been outstanding and a real pleasure to work with on these columns. So the first, first uh, priority is improving work and practice environments. So one example is the Clinical Practice Committee, led by Jim Richter, whose the picture is not here, Jim Bailey, Martin Ahrens, and the support of council liaison, Ethan Hom. They have reconfigured the Clinical Practice Committee to make this their priority. They're developing uh, website resources to help with care transformation. They're developing workshops for the annual meeting and other meetings. And they're exploring a collaboration with the AMA Steps Forward program that has a lot of resources to help with care transformation. We're increasingly collaborating with the Association of Chiefs and Leaders of General Internal Medicine. Mark Linsner is probably the national expert on physician wellness and uh, leading efforts here at NSJM and across our organization. And we're continuing efforts in the PCMH, team-based care, and care coordination. The second big priority is fair reimbursement for healthcare for primary care providers, which is also essential for ensuring the, the pipeline of trainees into primary care. We have an outstanding health policy committee chaired by Tom Steiger. And one of the major accomplishments of the past year was the creation of an association of cognitive specialties led by John Goodson, which involves about eight of the different cognitive specialties whose main job is to basically advocate for fair reimbursement of the cognitive specialties. So for example, add-on codes that increase reimbursement. And they are making a lot of progress talking to the folks at Medicare to basically redo the research that, to update the relative value unit scales that currently grossly under reimburse us as primary care providers. A third priority is increasing value of SJM to membership. A lot of things here. I'll just mention one, uh, led by Dan Tobin, Marilyn Shapira, Bennett Lee. The regions have a history of doing incredibly great things in terms of the great regional meetings. This group here has, has been brainstorming about how can the regions take it to the next level of providing even more value to the, the members through areas that often will then align them with the priorities we're talking about now. So very exciting work they're currently doing. Fourth is one which I think is 
in some ways maybe the most core thing to SJM, which is increasing career development opportunities. Uh, we have a number of great mentoring programs, such as the one-on-one -on -one mentoring program, launch tool programs, such as Teach for the Educators, Lead for Leaders. But what we haven't had so far is a systematic look across the three major pathways, education, research, and administration, to make sure that regardless of whether you're junior, mid-level, or senior, that you have the opportunities to acquire the types of skills you need to succeed, whatever your pathway is, and whatever, wherever you are in your stage of career development. And so uh, this new career program, so actually the kickoff is this Saturday. Um, Stephen and Margaret told you a little bit about that. Uh, we're, we're doing some increasing uh, focus upon career development programs and the development of these multi-year uh, programs. About a month ago, there was a retreat that involved most of the major committees and task forces here, led by Margaret, uh, to start doing some of this planning. So a lot more will happen over the next years over this, so be on the lookout for this. Fifth is leadership and cutting edge issues. So for example, this particular conference on population health, I mean, looking at the program, great program that the program committee put together, uh, really serves an example of this leading at the cutting edge. Now they say that for the president of SJM, the most important decision is who you pick to be the program chair. I picked Stephen Simon, and together Stephen and I picked Margaret Lowe to be the co-chairs, and man, the main, <laughs> Stephen and Margaret have been fantastic. I mean, they and the overall program committee have done what you want a program committee to do. They basically take ownership, they take on the best of the past programs, and to put a new stamp on in terms of innovations and a new ways of looking at things in a way that's inclusive and collegial. You know, they've been terrific, and it's really been a pleasure and honor to be working with you. And, you know, I've had to do very little in terms of support with them. They, they really have been tremendous leaders that just ran with things and been real true leaders of SJM. So thank you so much. You know, another example is that we're increasingly trying to do more collaborative work with our peer societies in family medicine and general pediatrics. The past year, Russ Phillips, Ted Long, Leo Horowitz have been leading a number of these discussions and engagements around population health and primary care collaborations with these societies. More will come over the next year. We've also had great strength in advocacy, whether it's funding for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and kudos to Andy Byman as our, our new director of ARC, uh, GMA reform, um, ABAM reform for the maintenance of certification program, and larger issues such as decreasing uh, the physician and government's role in, role in torture. Um, so some of our leaders, Nancy Keating, Bobby Barron, Eric Green, Preston Reynolds, and some of these different issues. And then a critical one that you've heard about a little bit from Ann, uh, growing M SEM membership at a healthy rate, where the Proud to be JM campaign is one of our, our hallmark programs. You know, again, led and originated by one of our most respected senior leaders, Ann Nettinger. Ann Nettinger. And then, I think yeah, a great story for SJM, you know, the person who's going to be taking over from Anne for this program, uh, as of now, really is Brita Roy, who was just finishing her first year on faculty at Yale. So another great example of, of, sort of cross-generational collaboration and the opportunities that are available for our most junior members, as well as how our senior, most senior members remain engaged in society and make invaluable contributions, along with staff, such as Francine Jeton in this particular example. We're undergoing major transitions at SJM. Uh, you know, Bill Moran, the past president, he's been a great mentor to me. You know, the, the guy that basically you know, whispers into my ear and basically advises me on what to do. Tremendously helpful, so thank you so much, Bill. Kay Ovington, one of the, the great pleasures of my year, I've been working with Acting Director Kay Ovington. More about Kay shortly. And we're thrilled to have Frank Fortin joining us as the new Executive Director. More about Frank shortly also. This is what I'd like to do a shout out to the, your next president, Eileen Reynolds. You know, Eileen, I knew as the acquaintance before this year, but over the past year, gotten to know her uh, a lot better. And she is going to be a fantastic president. You know, she's smart, she's dedicated, uh, she's committed, uh, she understands the whole society. Uh, she's a thinker as well as a doer. Uh, she's going to be a true servant of the society, and, you know, it's going to be great. She's going to be a fantastic president for SJM. So I started the, my talk with uh, a story about uh, Noko's family. I'm going to end my talk with a story about my family. So you see Toshi there, and my sister Karen, my brother Brad, and my two parents. Uh, my two parents have been two of my major role models. I'll tell you a little bit about my dad in particular. So he was born and, uh, and raised in Boston's Chinatown, actually at the edge of the neighborhood, uh, adjacent to a Syrian neighborhood. Um, he um, didn't have it easy. His mother passed away when he was three, and so he had uh, he, he uh, was raised at the school of hard knocks. 
know, both my parents come from large immigrant families. Uh, most of my uncles on my dad's side worked in the laundries. Most of my mom's side was uh, the, the noodles. noodles. Um, and uh, my dad, one of his great strengths is that he's genuinely interested in people. Uh, he's a great listener. He's a kind man. Uh, he's streetwise, street smart guy. Uh, can get along with anyone. Uh, and so, like, whenever I had like a major interview, like applying for medical school or residency or fellowship or faculty position, you know, I'd always you know get the advice of my parents and you know run things by them. And inevitably, at the end of their feedback, my dad would always say, "Marshall," you know, Chinese guy with the Boston accent, you know. <laughs> Masha, just be yourself. You'll do fine. So, <clears throat> when I think about SGIM, and I look at it, you here who are SGIM, who do I see? I see people driven by a mission. I see young people who are full of energy and hope, and who are passionate about making a difference. I see our mid-career people, sort of our, our engines, who are innovative leaders, who are curious and caring. I see our most senior members who are generous and wise mentors. I see people who value science and evidence and who want to get at the truth. I see people who are activists, who are attacking the truly important problems, trying to transform health career to be more patient-centered, people trying to achieve health equity, and people teaching our next generation of learners. And I see activists and idealists and altruists who seek a better healthcare system and who won't be satisfied until all of our patients have the best possible care and outcomes. And when I look at you and I see you who are SJM, I see people who I am proud to be colleagues with in the SJM family, people who treat people well and who are generous to our next generation. If my dad were up here giving this talk, and he was thinking about sort of the SGM's path forward in this challenging time, I think he'd smile and say, SJM, just be yourself. You'll do fine.